You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Sometimes I feel like putting different inflections, you know? Just, it just, you can mix it up a little bit. I don't know. I am your host, Ryan Schlipp, and this is the Packernet Podcast. Let's spice it up a little bit. So today, we got to rip through a little bit of news and notes. Got a question about Rashan Geary. It's one that we've already answered, but might as well talk about it again. Speaking of, I, I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but I have to say it again because I keep seeing it and it's driving me nuts. I got one more COVID-related comment. You you really have to stop saying, people need to stay home so we can get a football season back. You have to stop saying that. That doesn't make any sense. It makes literally zero sense. Staying home doesn't give us a football season back sooner. This is, this is a very simple formula. I, I don't mean to be rude. I love you guys, and I know you're very brilliant people. But there's a couple of you who keep saying this, who are regurgitating this, who need to knock it off. Let me ask you this very simple question. What happens when you flatten something? Just picture like a little squeezy ball. When you Push your hand down on top of it. What happens to it? Let me give you a hint. What happens to its girth? It gets wider, right? That's exactly the point of what we're doing. Flatten the curve also means widen it. And for the sake of what we're talking about, we're flattening the infections and elongating the amount of time that it takes. The more we stay home and hide, the longer it takes. Not saying it's the wrong thing. If this is what we need to do, to make sure that the hospitals don't get overrun, fine, great, big ol' thumbs up. Not going to make the football season come sooner. It's going to make this last longer. That's always been understood, right? It's kind of like, the, the, the whole thing is, let's just use fake numbers. Rather than having a thousand people get infected in a month, because we can't handle a thousand people in a month, because our hospital can only take on 500 in a month, again, making up numbers, We're going to take that and say, let's do 1,000 infections over four months. See? Now we can handle that. About 250 a month. Hospital's not overrun. Good to go. It's not about less infections. It's not about doing it quicker. It's about less in a shorter period of time. Elongating the the infections over a longer period of time so that we don't... I'm saying it over and over again, but I feel like some people are so entrenched in this, you're not getting it. It's a very simple concept. Flatten the curve simply means taking those infections and spreading them out over a longer period of time. There's no strategy. There's no thing in which if you just stay home, the virus is like, oh, shucks, they're all staying home. We better pack up and leave. That's, that's not a strategy. That's nobody's plan. That's not how viruses operate. She won't come out of her house, man. I quit. I'm, I'm leaving. I don't even want to be here. She's been in her house for like two months. I quit. That's, that's not what happens. It's not going away. Anyway, just 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 stop saying that, please. Sorry, but like I said, I just, you know, I see things that don't make sense, and people keep saying it, and then everyone gets around and applauds people for saying it, and it just drives me insane. Staying home is awesome, except for starting a football season. Moving on. Why don't we start with just a little bit of news. First of all, Ted Ginn to the Bears, which is the least surprising thing I've seen, well, that entire day, or month, or this year. Because the Bears love to go out and get free agent wide receivers. They're kind of like what the Baltimore Ravens were several years ago. And in fact, wasn't Ted Ginn a Raven for a while? He was not. He's been on every other team, not the Ravens. And the interesting thing is, he's doing kind of, I mean, not really, but kind of what Packer fans want. Ryan Pace is the GM that Packer fans want until he actually does it and it doesn't work out. We all sit here now and laugh at the guy. But the fact of the matter is there's been numerous occasions in which Packer fans have wanted something and the Bears end up getting the guy. And now Ryan Pace is the GM who is constantly taking swings at wide receiver, trying to bring in wide receiver after wide receiver after wide receiver, which from a fan perspective is great. 
The problem is we also need to acknowledge sometimes there's just no options. And pretty much any free agent that's been available, Ryan Pace has tried out, and they've all been pretty terrible. Allen Robinson is the only wide receiver on that team, is the only wide receiver they've ever had on that team. Yes, he is a free agent. He's also a wildly overpaid free agent. I'm going to stand my ground on that one. He's good, but, I mean, I don't know. I still think he's paid too much. But Ted Ginn... I mean, this is here's the thing. The Packers have done something that I talked about a long time ago that I very much agree with. And that is, if you can get somebody that is an upgrade over the big pile of eh, guys that we have, do it. If not, knock it off. Now, you can debate whether or not where Funches falls on this list. I think Funches is probably the top guy, so maybe it makes sense. I've said I put him kind of where Lazard is. He's not an elite football player, but he's probably a decent enough solid number two. But then you see as we go through the draft and free agency and things, Packer fans are saying, why, 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 why not, why not? What about this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? And the Packers haven't done anything. We know about the first few rounds. The first round, they didn't get a wide receiver because they really like Jordan Love. The next couple rounds, they had made, there's talks about in the second round, they were willing to trade up to get a guy, but he went just a little bit early or they couldn't get a trade partner, whatever the story was. But they tried. They did try to get a wide receiver because they wanted to upgrade that number two spot. Just didn't work out, so they got A.J. Dillon. And then in the third round, I think they said there was really one more guy that they wanted. He went right before, and I believe they were talking about Devin DuVernay because that's the only wide receiver that went kind of close to where they were drafting. And I think that was sort of the last one. And then everyone freaks out, well, you you didn't get any wide receivers in this draft. Right, and I agree with it because if you're not going to get a guy that's better than the pile that we have, I don't really want to waste a pick. So to contrast that with the Chicago Bears, there's not any real good options to upgrade wide receiver, but that's not going to stop them from wasting money on another wide receiver anyways. Ted Ginn is 35 years old. 35. He spent the last three years in New Orleans. There's not a a much better situation for a wide receiver to be in than New Orleans. His first year in New Orleans, he had a big uptick for as far as what his PFF grade was, presumably because he's with Drew Brees. I shouldn't say a big uptick, but it, it was a good year for him. Then it went down. And then it went way down. And in 2019, he had his worst grade since 2010, which, by the way, was a really weird anomaly of a year. It was his first year in San Francisco, only 272 snaps. I don't know if he was hurt or what happened, but it was a bad situation. This is basically, this past year was the worst year of his career. New Orleans lets him go because he's 35 years old. He's clearly over the hill. He graded out positively in two games all year, all year, two games. I mean, Ted Ginn is the epitome of a draft bust. Top 10 selection in 2007 by the Miami Dolphins. The highest graded year he's ever had was with the Carolina Panthers. His grade was a 75. He only spent three years in Miami. The guy's not good. He's never been good. He's 35, and he's at the lowest point in his career, and the Bears just picked him up. So if anybody was wondering my thoughts on Ted Ginn, oh, wow. Yikes. It's not even a matter of cost at this point. I, I could just I can already hear the Bears fans going, yeah, but I mean, come on, they, we they paid him nothing. I don't even think the contract details are out. But here's the situation: he's not even worth nothing. Keep your money, dude. I don't get it. I mean, Ryan Pace is becoming the guy that I feel like fans want in a GM. Like if if you, if you just gave a fan the GM spot, this is what they would do: just taking free agent swings at every single position of need and just especially getting guys that are names that are recognizable. Like, dude, Ted Ginn's out there? Dude, for sure give me Ted Ginn. I know his name. Yeah, man. I remember his hearing his name, like, lots of times. He was a first-round pick? What? From Ohio State? And he ran a 4-3-5? Give me that guy all day. Because I don't, I, don't I don't know what else you can do to justify picking this guy up. And again, I appreciate what the Packers are doing. I would there there becomes a time in which you say, "I'm glad you didn't take a wide." I'm not saying overall, I'm glad you didn't take a wide receiver, but there becomes a point at which you know what we missed out in the first three rounds, and we gave up a fourth. So at this point, you get into the fifth round, and it's like, Neh. there's nobody left. We have not dressed, addressed a single defensive player. There's no wide receivers that we feel like can compete in, in against the guys that we already have on our team. Why bother? We're talking about three rounds where they made attempts or would be willing to get wide receivers, and it just didn't turn out that way. Again, round one, there was a quarterback they wanted. You're not going to give up a wide re- or a quarterback for a wide receiver. Round two, they tried to trade up. 
something went wrong, don't remember exactly the details, didn't work out, they took A.J. Dillon. Round three, they had a wide receiver they liked, he got taken shortly before them, they ended up taking DeGuara. The chips just fell a certain way, they didn't get a wide receiver, eh, is what it is. Now I understand for some people, it's dire enough that we're going to give up whatever it takes. I mean, for some people, it's dire enough that I don't care if this is a generational talent quarterback in your mind, we're taking a wide receiver, which is silly, but there's all different levels. And again, you can you can say what you want to say. I'm just telling you, when you say it in those terms, which is the way that it is, it's not that bad. And again, this is an example of that bad. This is an example of desperation. This is an example of what some fans say we need to do, which is just do something. It's not about actually doing a smart thing. It's about just do something. Ryan Pace is the king of just do something, and it's a big part of the reason why the Bears are no good. It's a big part of the reason why I have faith in, although I don't know, maybe the Bears are going to have a great year, they're going to win the division, I don't know, I have no idea. Again, I haven't sat down and even looked at these teams and how they're broke down yet. We do have the rosters, or the um, the schedules coming out on Thursday, should be very exciting. Probably around that time, I'll start looking at this a little bit more in depth, because that does play into things a little bit, in terms of breaking down the division and whatnot. But... You know, it's sort of like last year when I looked at the Lions and I said, I think the Lions are going to be a pretty good team. I severely underestimated how terribly run the team is. And now that I know how terrible and toxic that locker room is, it doesn't matter what I come to as a conclusion, which I'm sure I'm going to look at and say, this is a good roster. Same as I said last year, and it's going to be better than last year. But this year I have to put in the factor that this is not going to work out because half this team doesn't even want to be there. And unless and until they fire that head coach and GM and find somebody else that comes in that can actually create a culture of, of, I I don't know of what, of whatever it is you want to build as long as people buy in, unless and until that happens, I can't give them any credit. And it's similar with the Bears. Regardless of what the roster is and how certain individuals might get a little bit better or a little little bit worse, this is a team that is run by a guy that has done nothing in terms of acquiring talent and helping this team grow. And every team that doesn't grow is regressing. Because every team essentially is regressing. Even if you factor in one or two guys that kind of turns the corner, right? You got one second-year guy, one third-year guy that suddenly becomes a stud, maybe. Okay, but how many free agents did you lose and how many guys just turned 32 years old and just don't have it anymore? That number is always going to be bigger. So it's, it's, you, you have to be on, on your game here. When you haven't had a first-round pick in several years, you haven't added really any talent in several years outside of a couple free agents, and you keep signing free agents like Ted Ginn, I just, I'm sorry, I don't believe in you. And and Nick Foles, in my opinion, is not enough to turn the Bears and, and this Ryan Pace organization into something that I believe in. Now again, I, I might completely do a 180 here, but I, I just keep seeing this, and it's just embarrassing. It's ridiculous. And, 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 you know, there, there are certain things that I say, eventually I'm going to get caught. I'm going to say stuff like Reggie Begleton. He's going to end up being like the number two, and people are going to dig up that old episode of me saying this guy's not even going to make the roster. They're going to throw it in my face. Oh, well, that's fine. I say stuff. I think I have a fairly decent track record, but sometimes I say dumb stuff, and I have to live with that. I have very little doubt in my mind that Ted Ginn is not going to be a problem for the Green Bay Packers. I'm not concerned at all. Nick Foles and Ted Ginn going to light the NFL on fire. Sure. Go ahead and slap some money down on that one. So anyways, the Bears got Ted Ginn. As for the Green Bay Packers, however, they signed a man by the name of Trayvon Hester, which is a little bit interesting. The first thing that I noticed is that Trayvon Hester is 6'2", 304, which is exactly, not exactly, but it's more or less that prototype that I said the Packers aren't really interested in. However, the general rule is that if you, it's more about function than body type. In other words, Mike Pettin generally likes the six foot six long arm guys because of what they're able to do. If you can be six foot two, three oh four and do the job that those guys do, okay fine. The other thing is maybe you just take a flyer on a guy because you think he's a good football player or there's something underrated about him. It's a little bit interesting with Trayvon Hester. The first thing to point out is he is the um, he is Mr. Double Doink. Trayvon Hester is the defensive lineman that got his hand on the ball which consequently caused the double doink, which eliminated the Bears from the playoffs. So as far I I couldn't, this guy could have PFF grades in the 20s every single game of his entire career, and I would still be okay with the signing just for that reason. The Green Bay Packers should be paying the man. 
Even if you just give him a paycheck just to come on the team and he doesn't even make the active roster, the Packers needed to give the man a paycheck. But he is a little bit intriguing. He's played for three teams in three years, which means it's generally not a very good sign. However, mixed in with a bunch of really terrible play is some really, really amazing play. It's it's really weird. For example, 2019 he was with the Washington Redskins. He had two games where he graded out in the 30s. He had three games where he graded out in the 40s. He had one, two, three, four, five, six games in the 50s, one in the 60s. His fourth highest graded game was a 63.4. You know what his third highest graded game was? 83.3, and then 85, and then 90. It's, 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 it's more or less, at least last year, he's a really bad football player that occasionally just puts it all together and the guy's a freak. The other interesting thing is that the three highest graded games are also three of the games in which he played the most snaps. Now, his highest game, he played 13 snaps, which is kind of high for him, but it wasn't really quite the highest. But 17 and 22 were the next highest graded games. Those are the first and second highest snap counts that he had all year. So that's also a good thing, because if it's the opposite way, then I just nullify all this. It doesn't matter. Right, if, if, if he played 15, 16 snaps and was terrible, but he had three really good games except he played four or five snaps in those games, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, though, when he was out on the field longer, he tended to do better. Some of these games in which he graded out terribly, three snaps, two snaps, one snap, three, seven, two, and six. S- games in which he had over ten times on the field, one, two, three, four of them, and three of them were below 60. Other interesting thing to note, two of the games in which he graded out really, really highly, the the reason he graded out really high, highly was his pass rush ability. So this is a six foot, six foot two, 304 pound guy that I don't think is going to do anything for us as a run defender necessarily, but he's got some real upside as a pass rusher. Now this is a seventh round pick out of 2017, selection 244. Again, he's left He's left two teams in two years, including, by the way, the Philadelphia Eagles. In 2018, his overall PFF grade was an 86.2. His run defense grade was an 83. His pass rush grade was a 74. They let him walk. So when I say it's intriguing, that's more or less why. I mean, it, it's st- there's a reason for that, and I don't know what exactly that reason could possibly be. I understand teams don't generally use PFF, and I understand PFF isn't a flawless system. But there's got to be a good amount of overlap. PFF, it's unlikely that they looked at it and graded him out as almost an elite prospect. Only 261 snaps on the year, but, I mean, that's a decent size. It's not Kenny Clark numbers, but it's also not Rashawn Gary numbers. I mean, he was out there as a rotational defensive lineman. Seventh round pick, 261 times, 103 times defending the run, 157 times rushing the passer. Got an 83 overall grade against the run and a 74 pass rush grade and they let him go. It's just it's just weird to me. He's only 27 years old. So again, if I had to guess, he's not going to be high impact. But the guy has proven he can do something, especially since we're more or less looking for a rotational player. Not that we you know, love the guys that we have, but the guys that we have are the guys that we have. Dean Lowry is going to be a massive part of this. Kenny Clark is going to be a big part of this. We've got guys like Zadarius that are going to be playing inside quite a bit. we got guys like Kiki that hopefully can take a step. Trayvon is going to be in the mix. And again, as much as I generally look at seventh round guys that get picked up on the fly like this and say, this is not worthless, please stop even worrying about it. I don't know. Slightly intrigued by Trevon Hester. Even his first year in Oakland, which is the team that drafted him in the seventh round, his overall grade was a 67. And if you've been following along, a lot of the guys that the Packers have picked up, I mean, 67 for any rookie is not a terrible year. That's probably above average for a rookie. So there's there's a little bit of upside in terms of his pass rush, although his, his stats have never been all that great. He had 11 pressures on 191 attempts in 2017, 10 pressures on 157 attempts, and then this past year, four pressures on 58 attempts. None of those are at the 10% mark. But again, the upside in terms of when he plays really well generally is because he does a great job as a pass rusher. And so I could at least see where you would get a defensive lineman, a defensive coordinator, a head coach, and a GM looking at this going, you know what, I think this guy's got some developmental potential. Or possibly even just situational potential. Maybe they're identifying something in which if we can just use him on these situations, he tends to do a pretty good job. This system, this situation, with this guy to his right and this guy to his left, whatever whatever the case may be. I, I Again, I'm intrigued. Anyways, before I forget, we might as well take a little bit of a break. Please make sure, if you haven't done so yet, that you are in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. Make sure you like the Packernet Podcast Facebook page. 
If you haven't done so yet, if you wouldn't mind leaving a five-star iTunes rating and review, that'd be greatly appreciated. If you don't use iTunes, there's always Stitcher. You could go to Stitcher.com, find it. You don't even need an, an account. Just go down to the bottom. It's on the right. Leave a review. Done deal. There's also several other ways to support the podcast. Links are in the description. And if I may reiterate, again, the biggest thing that I'm really trying to make a push for this year is to grow the Packernet Podcast Facebook page. So if you haven't done that yet, please do that. I'm trying to make an effort to get more videos and content in there. Also, just to be a little bit spiteful, (laughs) um, if there's news, like there's no podcast today, I usually put it in the Facebook group first, or excuse me, in the, the Facebook page first, and I'll just leave it sit there and marinate for a while, and then I'll share it with the group. Just because, you know, I don't know. I, I need there to be some kind of reason to be in the page, but not the group. But, but, but you, you know, you can't see it in the group. I don't know. Just do it, all right? Pretty please with sugar and bacon. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details so there was a uh question from travis Asking, do you think this COVID-19 thing had anything to do with the Packers maybe drafting more developmental players since it's looking like training camp and OTAs are going to be affected this summer or this offseason? In general, I don't think so. I don't know that the strategies went out quite that far. I think you've been building up for decades a general strategy on what it means to be a GM, how you scout, how you draft. I just don't think you can morph things to a massive degree in other words what i think a lot of people have been saying is since wide receivers don't hit in the first year anyways it kind of makes sense to i don't know go with a different position which is it kind of a weird talking point i'm not saying travis said this but I've, I've seen this out there wide receivers don't generally hit in their rookie yeah but that's true but neither does anybody else that's kind of the point in general rookies don't do a good job wide receivers quarterbacks offensive linemen, defensive linemen, linebacker. I mean, I, I can go through the whole list if you like. Rookies don't play well. And so although it makes sense, I would just be surprised if they said, you know what, since we might not have OTAs, and running back maybe is different insofar as, not that they're usually good as rookies, I don't think that's the case. However, it does seem to be the case that running backs need less specific training in a system that is to say they're a little bit more plug and play where you can just bring them in and say run through that hole and they know how to do that because they've been doing that since peewee football and all the nuance about this and that that you if you know how to do it you know how to do it 
And so there's still the terminology aspect of it, but there's not like a quarterback trying to teach him footwork and all that stuff. But in terms of do I think they deliberately felt like running back, for example, was a good pick because we might not have OTAs, I just would be really surprised if that's the reality of it. Then there's the other angle. People say, well, what if we don't even have a football season? Could that be part of it? No, because that just kind of pushes things back even further. So if you're getting guys that are quote unquote developmental, and again, this isn't, I'm not saying Travis said this, I'm just elaborating. If you're getting players that maybe aren't good in their first year, but need some time to develop, well, then you're not really developing them anyways, right? Because you're taking a year off this year and then next year is kind of their first year, but then they're developmental players. So then you've got two years. In other words, I I, I guess I don't see how this COVID-19 thing helps to develop players. If anything, you want more instant impact as opposed to developmental. Either way, though, I, I just, I don't really buy any of it. I think the only real thing that that mattered was the fact that they had less information and they operated from that. So if somebody had an injury issue, um, then they were probably a little less likely to take them because they weren't able to bring people in to get tested. Also, maybe some smaller school guys that they wanted to see in person but weren't able to because of this whole situation those guys probably tended to fall, which is why there's probably some later round guys that might actually be pretty good football players. But I don't think in terms of drafting certain positions that had anything to do with it. That's my hunch, and I'm fairly confident in that. Another question that was asked, and I'm ripping through these real quick here, and this has been talked about a lot, um, so let me reiterate. The question came up, especially now that after the draft, we know that we haven't really done anything in free agency or the draft to fix the fact that we don't know how to stop the run. We haven't done anything to fix the fact that we were really bad at stopping the run, especially against certain teams. Why not, since we already have enough pass rushers, just move Rashawn Gary inside? Couple points. Number one, even when he came out of Michigan, I don't think he was any good at it. I saw him moved inside. I saw him get pushed around inside. I didn't see a guy that was very good on the inside. And I think that the reason this generally comes up is because he's he was seen as more of a run defender than a pass rusher. And so when you see a guy that's big, as he is, for an edge rusher, that is, he's big for an edge rusher, who's pretty good against the run, but maybe not quite as good against, you know, as a pass rusher, the, the automatic assumption is, well, if we slide him inside, he's still good as, against the run, but he's going to be even better as a pass rusher on the inside. I mean, it just... The bottom line is you can't just jump from A to B. Being bad off the edge doesn't automatically mean you're going to be good on the inside. You can't just make that leap. And so the other aspect is if you wanted to do that, you have to actually commit to it. That is to say, all of his training, his diet, uh, you need him to bulk up in a big way because he's too light to be inside. And you have to train him to be a defensive lineman, which he's never really been trained to do before. He was a 4-3 defensive end. That's a different position than a, you know... 3-4 3-4 defensive end, or a 4-3 defensive end, depending on alignment. It's a different position, different rules, different everything. And so it's not just a matter of we're taking an edge rusher and moving him inside, although Zadarius can do it. When you're talking about Rashawn, who is still developing and learning, you're stopping his development as an edge rusher, moving him inside, and making him a defensive tackle based on no information that this is going to work, just hoping it does. Maybe if we make him fatter, he'll be a good defensive tackle. We have no idea whether or not that'll work. I, I don't really see the logic in that. And I know some people think he'd be great on the inside. I, again, I just don't. Now, maybe he can develop into that, but here's the thing, and here's sort of the final point. There's no point wondering because the Packers aren't going to do it. They've been very, very clear on this. They had no intention of ever making him a defensive tackle. They are leaning him out. They're making him thinner. So they're moving in the opposite direction. If you've noticed, he is a, a leaned-out dude. They want him to learn to go from a hand-in-the-dirt defensive end to a stand-up outside linebacker. They have talked about how we need to train him to do one thing. Then once he masters that one thing, then you can start to develop more and more and more. That one thing they're trying to teach him to be is a stand-up outside linebacker. There is no chance that they, again, undo all of this development, say forget all of it, move him inside, despite the fact that he's leaner, he's too small, he was never really good as a defensive tackle at Michigan, which again, you can argue with me on that if you want, I just, I I watched him. Very rarely was he moved inside, and when he was, these big 320-pound guards just pushed him right out of the way. Because even though he's big on the outside as an end, he's not big as a defensive tackle. Next to Dean Lowry, and, and, and Dean Lowry's a small, he's like, what, 295 for a defensive tackle? He's pretty leaned out, especially at 6'6", or whatever he is. But you put Rashawn Gary in the mix, he's tiny. And I understand Zadarius is on the inside at times. 
But again, you can't just make that leap that anybody who's not good on the outside, you can just push him on the inside and he's fine because he's a pretty good run defender on the outside. So then you just put him on the inside. He'll still be a good run defender, but he's also a pass rusher. So now he can pass rush too. It's that we're just picking and choosing which facts we want to, to believe in to make this work, right? The only thing that changes is the fact that he becomes a better pass rusher, right? That changes. When you move inside, it's easier to rush the passer against guards, right? Somehow we're just making this up because he's leaner and faster, so so that'll work. However, the run defense, that doesn't change. That stays the same. No, come on now. Everything changes. We don't know that he would be a good pass rusher on the inside, and we do know pretty well that he would struggle to stop the run. And again, it, it's not worth even talking about because they're moving in the exact opposite direction. They want him to get leaner. They want him to get faster. They're working on his pass rush moves. They're working on all these different things, all the nuance that goes with it. Everything you need to know to be an outside linebacker. They want him to master that, become very good at that, and then they slowly start to build on that so that hopefully one day he becomes the next Zedarius Smith. But there is no situation in the world in which they do a complete 180 and say, you know what, forget edge rusher, it's not that big of a deal. Let's just make him a fat defensive lineman. Tell him to sit around, eat donuts, gain 40 pounds, and we'll put him in the middle because it just works. It doesn't work that way. So bottom line is I'm all the way out on that. If we see Rashawn on the inside, it's a good thing because it means that they feel comfortable with what he's done on the outside and they're starting to expand what it is he does. Um, question from Gordo, and I kind of answered this already, but the question is about wide receiver, and, and more specifically, though, who in the future is going to be playing wide receiver since we're not adding new bodies? It's a fair point. Um, if you just look at where we're at right now, there are essentially three wide receivers that are on the roster beyond this year. Funches, Kumaro, Daryl Stewart, Reggie Begleton, Malik Taylor, Alan Lazard, Darius Shepard, James... James Looney. I don't know why they moved him. KB on Ento. I'm so confused by the James Looney thing. James Looney is a defensive tackle. Anyways, whatever. All of these guys are signed only through 2020. That's not a big list. And and when you expand on that and say, of those three guys that are on the team, let's see, uh, MVS and Equinemius are on until 2022 and Devontae's on 2022, or they become free agents in 2022, which is to say, the entire team is done after this year, unless we re-sign guys, which is kind of where I'm going to go with this, obviously. There must be a different James Looney. That must be what it is. Sorry I keep getting hung up on it, but did we get an undrafted free agent by the name of James Looney, who just happens to be the same name as the defensive tackle James Looney? Anyways, the other issue is, of these three guys, how many of them do we feel confident in actually being contributors beyond 2020? MVS, some people haven't given up on. I more or less have. I like Equinemius, but we really haven't seen his upside yet. I'm somewhat confident in him, but there's been other guys that have shown little bits of flashes, like Marquez, like Kumaro, like, you know, I don't know if Trevor Davis really ever did as a wide receiver, like Geronimo, that we thought maybe could be the answer, that just clearly were not the answer. And so, the you know, the, the, the in short term, the, the cop-out answer is, we got to see how this year plays out. I don't really feel good about MVS. Um, I don't think Jay Kumaro is going to be on the team much longer. I've already said I don't believe Reggie Begleton is going to even make the team, and if he does, it's going to be because Kumaro and MVS didn't, and they want to at least see if they can make it work, but I don't think it's going to work. But we also have Devin Funches, which I know a lot of people, myself included, aren't super excited about, but he's 25 years old. He's still very young. And so potential, guys that could potentially be extended, Devin Funches is 25, Alan Lazard is only 24, Devontae's still going to be on the team, MVS and EQ we don't have to get rid of, Reggie Begleton is 26, I mean we don't really have any old wide receivers on the team, Devontae and Kumaro are 27, that's still young, you got Darius Shepard is 24, it's, it's, it's a really young group, so as far as what are we going to do in the future, I mean none of these guys have to go away, so if if, if if this wide receiver group is at least good enough, we can just keep this group. Now, obviously, the plan is going to be at some point to get better at wide receiver. It didn't work out this year, again, for several reasons. If they had had it higher on the priority list, they would have obviously been more aggressive in getting one, but they didn't feel the need to, and it didn't fall to them, so whatever. Also, again, Ted Ginn is kind of where we're at in the free agent market, so there's no point in going out and trying to get free agent wide receivers. So it's kind of a better luck next year thing. But I, I will say, I do think it's it's going to continue to be dire including next year where we're going to have to start doing something it's still wait and see because again if Devontae and Funches plus the tight ends if if the offense works then it's not 
a really big deal because, again, these guys are all young and we can carry this on as long. Whoever is a key piece, we can have Devontae, Lazard, Funches, EQ, and whoever else we decide to bring into this. And if that works, great. Because, again, remember, a big part of this offense is that we're going to be relying more on tight ends as receivers and getting the running backs working, getting guys like Aaron Jones even more involved in the passing game. And so the offense as a unit is going to work to where it's not just a matter of we need wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver. That's the other part we need to kind of get our head around. Whether or not it's going to work, I don't know, but that's why I say we got to wait and see. And the question is if, or the, the answer is if the offense works, we don't have to worry about it. If it's not working and if a glaring issue still is that the wide receivers are not producing enough, and we're going to have to make sure that that's the point and not that Aaron Rodgers just isn't throwing to wide open guys, then we have to address it. But even so, you know, it, it's still just a talent question, and we need to add one more talented wide receiver, but it's still not really a dire need in terms of we're just going to run out of bodies. We have plenty of bodies. We have plenty of guys that can contribute. They're all extremely young. It's a ridiculously young group. And so I'm, I'm not really very worried about it. But it, it is going to get to the point where you start to get worried because Devontae's, you know, he's going to be 28 next year. And if there's nobody else, it's like we, we kind of got to start building this up because before you know it, Devontae's going to be on his way out. You figure 28, 29, 30, three or four more years, they're going to be moving on from Devontae. We need a guy that's going to come in and fill that spot. It took Devontae three years just to get in his groove. That's unusual, but still, I mean, at some point, again, we got to find a guy. But I don't think we necessarily have to panic now. That's how I feel about it. I don't know. In other words, it's we're getting there. We're getting to the point of panic. I don't know that we're there yet. we got to see how this offense works. My bigger issue, as I've said, is offensive line. And I do find it funny. I'm looking at uh, over the cap right now. No, oh, that's ridiculous. Never mind. I was going to say they've already got Simon Stepaniak in at right guard. But they put Billy Turner at left guard and Elton Jenkins at center. That's not how that's going to work out. Unless we move on from Corey, but there's no indication that's going to happen. Anyways, that's my thought on wide receiver. I mean, it, it just is what it is. And in the future, the only real dire need is obviously hopefully finding a better number two, but also at some point finding a guy that we can develop to take the reins as the new number one when Devontae's out the door, which seems like it's a long way away, but I don't think it really is. I think there's maybe one more contract for Devontae before it's time to start looking in a different direction. Not that I want that or anybody wants that. It's just the way these things go, right? Once they get up to 31 years old or so, the Packers are kind of like, eh, yeah, you're still pretty good, but it's time to move on. And we get upset about it, and rightly so, but it is what it is. But the the, the, the issue is, when we got rid of Jordy, we still had Randall Cobb and we still had Devontae. When we got rid of Randall, it was like, well, we still have Devontae. At this point, we have nothing. So again, we've got plenty of time, but not really plenty of time so we gotta at some point find something or someone um randall had brought up the point here that very good teams value backup quarterback you look at guys like Taysom hill you look at teams like Jameis winston and now you have the cowboys getting andy dalton which again yesterday i called that an all-in move making sure you've got a number two guy so that if somebody goes down if your quarterback goes down you're not completely out of it right if you're going all in you better have a backup quarterback plan because quarterback gets hurt quarterbacks get hurt and having somebody there to make sure you can continue on is in a sense an all-in move we're, we're, we're covering all our bases to make sure that this is the year I think we should also maybe give the Packers some credit for that aspect as well because a lot of people are saying the Packers are, are just developing for the future they're doing nothing about going in all all in right now which again I've, I've disagreed with wildly I know people get stuck on wide receiver and again I just I I, I wanted a wide receiver too but looking back on the season, it's hard to argue that a wide receiver makes the day. It doesn't help us beat the 49ers at all, not even a little bit. So that's not the answer. If anything, you're looking for a defensive tackle as a boom or bust situation. But again, we got pieces that we feel Matt LaFleur needs to make his offense go, which is the most important thing. What do we need to make this thing go? I'm not, I'm not going to explain it again. I've said it a thousand times. We need the pieces. They went out and got the pieces. New offensive lineman, another tight end to fill that H-back role, and a running back. A guy that can be the 20 carry a guy running back if if that's what you want, whatever. So now we have that. But we're still in, if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, we're out of it territory. Now, I don't think we drafted him just to be a, an insurance policy, but that doesn't mean, but the, the fact remains he is an insurance policy. He's a guy that we can ha at least have some hope in that if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, he can continue this. He can maybe win us a few games, pull a Matt Flynn, so that we get into the playoffs so when Rodgers comes back, he can continue on. Or if he gets hurt in the playoffs, we have a chance. 
there is still an element, and I don't think this is a big part of why they did what they did, but there is still an element of for today. Because again, you can be as all in as you want, but if you don't have any quarterback depth, I mean, we, we literally saw a team very recently lose their quarterback and win a Super Bowl because they had a guy that was competent enough to carry this really good football team through the, the playoffs into the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. And that was Nick Foles, by the way. Not because Nick Foles is elite, but the point is the Eagles were all in. They spent lots and lots and lots of money on free agent pieces and in the draft and everything else to develop this team. If they hadn't done something as at a backup quarterback spot, they're done. Carson Wentz goes out, they're done. But they got a guy that can do enough, who can follow the system, shut his mouth, do what he's told, get the ball to the guy that needs to get the ball, and they won a Super Bowl with that. And again, as was pointed out here, you have the Saints with Taysom Hill slash Jameis Winston. Why? Because they're all in. Drew Brees very rarely gets hurt, but they understand that their window is very, very much closing. They're very close to a time in which, you know, this run is over. And if Drew does get hurt, it's done. The window just closed. However, if you have Taysom Hill and Jameis Winston there, there's a chance. You can keep pushing this thing, especially if it happens during the regular season. The, the, the point is, if this happens, say, week three, and he's out for five weeks... You don't want to lose five games. If you can have Jace, uh, Jameis or Taysom in there to win three of those five, you're still right back on track. Drew comes back in, and you're, you're well, back on track. Dallas is doing the same thing with Dalton, and now the Packers have a viable option. Now, I understand he's developmental, and a lot of people just don't like Jordan Love and think it's not going to matter anyways. That's a separate issue. If Jordan Love's garbage, then it's a bad pick no matter how you spin it. If he is as good as as the Packers think he can be, he is that insurance policy. He is potentially the thing that if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, can help us win a couple games. On top of being potentially the replacement for Aaron Rodgers down the road, 2022 or later, or whatever the situation is. So again, it's just a matter of they also deserve that level of credit. That's what teams are doing, and it makes sense. It is, in a sense, an all-in move, despite the fact that everybody says the Packers aren't going all-in. Um... I don't know, we're kind of at a weird spot here. I think I'm just going to stop there. We're at about 40 minutes, that's good enough. Feels like a weird spot to stop, but there's nothing I can really do in just a couple short minutes here, so we'll call it a day. You folks go ahead and enjoy your Tuesday. All right, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.